What do you think is best? Do you think that they should be spending that time or should they be spending money? Should it be a combination of both? Like, what do you feel is most appropriate? And does it does that answer change based on the size of the firm and the level of resources that the advisor has at their disposal? Well, so now that once you just start thinking about it in this way, I find the whole mindset starts to shift because now what you're really coming down to, first of all, the question becomes, well, what is your client acquisition cost? Welcome to the Model FA. Today I have the esteemed Michael Kitzes here on the podcast. Michael, thank you so much for for your time. My pleasure, Patrick. I'm I'm excited to be on and uh, talk talk advisor marketing and business stuff. It's always yeah. fun thing, fun stuff to talk about. I actually think that the new TAMP is essentially a marketing TAMP. It's a turnkey marketing agency inside of an RIA. So that's really what what we're building inside of ours because I I see the value in marketing and I see the value of pulling the lever and just producing more clients and equipping advisors to serve them. I mean, how how does an advisory firm get how do, how do they have that shift to see the value of marketing? Like, where do you see that happen at three billion? And they're just like, "All right, we've had the shift. We've got enough money. Might as well try it." Is there something that happens more formally? Is it, is it a decision that's made? Like, what what causes that shift? So, I, I think there are a few different factors that can cause that shift, and and it, it happens up and down the scale. Just it seems to happen with some frequency as firms clear about about three billion dollars. So let me start with like why it tends to happen at $3 billion firms, and then we'll sort of work backwards as to okay. who else gets there and how and why. So, so if you look at how, let me actually take one step back. So if you look at how most large RAs, like the billion plus firms and the multi-billion dollar firms have grown over the past sort of 15 to 20 years of the RA movement, most of them were founded in maybe late 80s and into the 90s, maybe the really early 2000s. Like they've been doing this about 20-ish years. Mm -hmm. And the way it happened for most of them was advisor starts firm, often in a loose partnership with maybe two or three others, and they go out there and they get clients. And if you were doing this back in the 90s, you didn't have a lot of competition. Most people were still selling commission stuff for just like were literally mutual fund salespeople. They weren't even doing asset allocated portfolios. Like they were mutual fund salespeople. I started my career 20 years ago next to a guy whose whole business was made selling the Munder Net Net Fund, uh, which was a like all internet startups fund in 1999. It blew up catastrophically 12 of 24 months later. Uh, So like, they were mutual fund salespeople. You went out and did this advisory thing. You just started gathering clients. It was really lean in the early years because, you know, Munder Net Net paid you 5.75% of first year revenue immediately because that was the commission. Gathering an AUM fee was like you got 0.25% three months from now with your first quarterly billing. So it was really rough early on. But you started accumulating clients and their recurring revenue. And so what would happen for most of these firms is after a couple of years, there would be two or three advisors. They would get one or $200 million of revenue and they hit a wall. And the wall is, I don't have any time to do any more of the marketing because I'm spending all my time servicing the one or $200 million of the clients I've got. Yep. And so the leading practice management advice in the early 2000s, when for the leading firm started hitting this wall was, you've got to hire associate advisors and hand your clients off to them so you can free up your capacity to be the awesome business development founder owner you are, mm-hmm. hand the clients off, go get more and fill up your, your, your associate advisor's book. And if you fill up that associate advisor's book completely, go get another associate advisor, <laughs> get more clients, hand it off to them and just wash, rinse, repeat. And that was the formula that most firms used to get to a billion dollars under management. But just two or three advisors doing that, bringing in 10, 20, $30 million a year across each advisor, repeated for 10, 15, 20 years, yep. got you to a billion dollars with a little bit of market growth. That would like that was the billion dollar firm formula. Now the challenge that would hit for a lot of those firms is by the time you've done that, like you get to a billion, like cool job, put a put a feather in your hat, like you've you've reached go to the a, TD conference, you've reached an achievement you've that only two or three percent of our get to. But by then, like you're, you're twenty years older, <laughs> this stuff's getting a little bit tiring. Um, it used to be cool to work your butt off for the year and get twenty million dollars of new of new client assets, right? Because Back at 100 million, that was 20% growth. 
But then at 500 million, that was only like 4% growth. Now it's only 2% growth. And you've got like eight or 10 advisors and 20 or 30 staff, all of whom are looking and staring at you saying like, <laughs> so you're going to keep growing so I can get job opportunities, right? And, and the founder looks in the mirror and is like, holy crap, like I have to get 50 to $100 million across each of us partners just to sustain the growth that we were doing before because that denominator got so big and like, I don't know if I've got it in me to keep doing this after I've been working my backside off for 20 years. Yeah. And so the growth rates would start to slow a little. Uh, you know, that tyranny of the denominator gets hard, not just because the denominator is bigger, so the rate gets slower, but just the founders by then are not in the same state of mind and growth orientation as they were before. Not the least of which, because you're now running a firm with $10 million of revenue and probably one and a half to $3 million of profits. Like you're making pretty good money. You don't have a lot of incentive to keep working your butt off that way. So firms would try to rotate and they say, you know what? We've gotten all these uh, associate advisors. They've got all these clients. We now have like hundreds of clients. These clients should be giving referrals. We're going to teach our advisors to ask for referrals and try to grow internally by having the advisors who weren't originally hired to do business development. They were just supposed to take the clients from the business developers. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to try a term into business developers. So firms tend to try that. That's usually the path from one billion to two billion. Yep. It usually doesn't go very well uh, <laughs> because you know the founders keep bringing in some business, some client referrals come in. You know, just apples fall off trees periodically. But most of these advisors weren't hired to be business developers. Frankly, if they wanted to do business development and they were good at it, they probably would have gone and made their own firm in the first place. Like they took the job with you because they didn't want to do that. Yep. And now it's across a billion dollars. You tell them they need to do that, so they do a little of it but it's not really how they're wired. They don't tend to be great at it. The firm's growth rate gets slower and slower. Now, the good news is by the time you got into a billion, heck, if you just sit tight and don't screw anything up, market, market growth. growth will turn you into 2 billion in another 10 years. Yep. And that's usually the path from 1 billion to 2 billion. You <laughs> kind of like grind it out. Founders are still doing some. Next generation advisors are doing some. Market's carrying more and more of the weight. The growth rate gets slower and slower. And so- a lot of firms then essentially die in the two billion range. Well, they don't. Okay. They don't die. But like the growth rate flatlines. You get to a point where look, it just if clients are pulling out two, three, four percent a year in spending, and you lose two percent for for just you know they die of old age because you're working with retirees, mm -hmm. and you're looking at four or five percent of outflows between spending and just client death. Even if you're awesome and you do a great job for your clients and like you're high valued, well, God, four or five percent outflows on two billion dollars, like that's a hundred million dollars going out the door every year. And that's a really hard threshold to clear to keep growing. Yeah. And so firms tend to flatline in the two to three billion range because of all these factors and the tyranny of the denominator adds up. And so they tend to hit a crossroads. Um, some firms say, damn it, we're gonna figure out how to change the culture around here to be more business development and growth oriented, and they try to solve it internally. A whole bunch of them say, well, can't figure out how to grow from clients and advisors. We're just going to go buy some. And they go <laughs> full scale into the inorganic realm. And then some firms look at this and start getting focused on, well, again, you know, we, like, we are $2 billion. It's like $20 million of revenue. If we just spend a couple percent of our, our dollars on marketing, it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like we never thought about this for this way before, but what would happen if we spent half a million dollars on marketing, even though we've hardly ever spent anything on marketing in the past? Like, it feels like a big number in dollar amounts, but relative to our revenue, like this is still only two or 3% of our revenue. We can manage this. Yep. And they put in, you know, two or 3% of their revenue, but hundreds of thousands of dollars and some results start showing up. Usually not great, but it's enough, right? This was free cash flow profits anyways. So- mm -hmm. We're just trying to take an alarm here and trying it out, but it starts working. You'd look at the math. You're like, well, I'll be damned. Like we, we spent a half a million dollars and, and, and we actually got 50 clients off of this. Like it's $10,000 per client. It's not great, but our average client's a millionaire. So we'll actually make that back on the first year. And then every year thereafter is profit. Like we should do a little more of this. Like this is sort of working. And then they start reinvesting more dollars into marketing find some efficiencies, find some economy skill, just find some strategies that work, right? Like the whole thing around marketing is you try a bunch of stuff, you try to find a thing that works, then once you find the thing that works, you just back up Do the cash and pour as much cash in that strategy as you can until it peters out and then you got to go find the next thing. Yep. And so 
the firms start finding something that works. They pour more money into it. They get more efficient at it. They start scaling that marketing process. And that's why suddenly a, a subset of firms sort of slingshot out of the 3 billion realm and very quickly go three, four, five billion and start climbing towards 10 yep. heavily from organic growth because they figure this out. And it's, it's not unique to large advisory firms. Like anybody in theory can do this, but you know, their marketing has both a hard dollar cost, right? Just, you got to spend some of the dollars to get the word out and do your thing. And there's, and there's some staff overhead cost, right? Like you don't just have to spend the money on the advertising. You have to spend the money on the person who's going to do the advertising, whether it's, you know, digital ads or in-person ads or event marketing, like whatever it is. If you're going to do marketing, there's both the spend on the marketing thing and there's the spend on the marketing people to do the thing. So like yeah. you have to spend money to spend money. Very. I, I feel like a lot of advisors at, at that level, the mistakes that they make is they go out and they say, okay, I, I, we, I know we need to do marketing. It's usually the founders talking. So they go out and they find a marketing director, someone who has broad experience being a marketing manager. Yep. They pay that person 80 to $150,000. That person then goes to an agency and the agency woos the marketing director with a really nice pitch deck on why they need to have this amazing branded website and experience and the videos of the founders. But there's never a distribution strategy. Like very rarely do I see an advisory firm that understands content creation all the way through distribution in a way that's going to get somebody's attention. I feel like for most firms at that level, what I've seen is like, Hey, and I, and I deal with this because I spend $100,000 a month in advertising in the financial services space. And I have these conversations with the billion or $2 billion firm. And it's always the founder who initiates, hands me off to the marketing director. And the marketing director is like, hey, we're working with J.O. Rawson out in uh, Atlanta. Yeah. And J.O. Rawson has quoted us 120 grand for a fancy UI on our yep. homepage. And that's going to produce X, Y, yep. and Z. And I'm like, cool, you know have fun. You just wasted yep. 120K. So yep. like, how are these firms in your mind, how many of these firms are effectively making the shift and spending money in a way that's actually producing ROI versus just tossing money into the fire and hiring staff well, and pretending? I, I think, I think very few are very few are spending effectively, at least until, and unless they get to that larger size. And, and the reason really is like, it's, it's not that the marketing spend is ineffective or that they're not putting enough towards it. I mean, there is some minimum critical mass. Like you, you, yep. you, you know, expect it's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars per client to get a client. And that should oh, be a yeah. good thing because they spend more than that. And your lifetime client value is way more than that. Uh, but like, it's going to cost you some money. Even if you're working with less affluent clients, you know, you're, you're only getting paid, you know, one or $2,000 per client. Uh, uh, at the lower end where there's a little bit less competition, like you're still going to spend hundreds of dollars per clients just to get one person in the door. Like that, that's just markets are relatively efficient <laughs> marketing. Yeah. You know, you can make some money, but it's not super low hanging fruit. So you can kind of scale the marketing spends. Like, you know, if I got 10 or 20 grand to spend, I can get a couple clients. If I got a hundred grand to spend, I can get more. If I got a million to spend, I can get more. But the challenge is, Fully executing a, a marketing process from end to end, frankly, I, usually isn't a part-time person's job. Rarely even <laughs> yeah, is it a full-time not. person's job. It often takes a marketing team, unless you find like just a particular hyper-focused strategy that you're really good at and you can do lean. And you know, some advisors do that well. It could be a digital marketing strategy. They could just have like a, a seminar marketing thing they're really good at. They know how to get butts in the seats and do their yep. thing and they can do it lean, more power to them. But like fully integrated marketing processes where you got to look at all the pieces of the funnel. Like how do we, how do we build awareness? How do we get, uh, uh, you know, what we call it the, the top of funnel leads, like people who are checking out our stuff, then how do we engage them in the middle to move them through to a sale? And then how do we actually get them to do the sale and convert them into a client? Like that's often a multi a multi person team to execute fully. And so, the $3 billion firms get there because they're like, well, geez, even if I just put a couple percent of my revenue towards marketing, I literally have half a million to a million dollars. So I can hire three to five people and give them a couple hundred thousand dollars to work with. And the math works. And, that, and that's frankly why they see some of the fast rising growth. The smaller firms, you know, sort of all of us mere mortals, like the, you know, the other 98% <laughs> of advisory firms, uh, this is challenging because you don't just have to spend the money on marketing like the actual spend, you got to spend the money on the people 
to build and create and manage it. Yeah. And often that's a more than one person job unless you figure out like a really awesome hyper-targeted marketing strategy, which maybe you can do if you've got a niche, but if you don't even have a niche, you're not going to find in a trouble. marketing strategy. And this gets hard. And so I, I think for most other firms, they struggle because either they don't spend the money, just they literally don't spend the money on the marketing cash, right? They do soft mm-hmm. dollar, time-based marketing client acquisition instead of hard dollar, or they do the hard dollar spend, but they underspend on the staffing. Uh, you, particularly smaller firms, because you know the, the human beings are expensive. Like you might spend more on the staffing than you actually do on the marketing dollars, just to make the marketing dollars you do spend efficient. And and that to me is why I've always been fascinated by by models like yours and just the 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 folks that are starting to come into the table that say, hey, like we're we're an outsourced full service marketing agency that can do this end to end. And like, you don't have to hire your two, three, five staff members. You're going to hire fractional time from ours. And yep. you know, in, in other industries, outsourced marketing agencies that have the people to do the work and manage the dollar spend is fairly standard. It's a new thing in our advisor world to have outsourced full service marketing agencies. But I, I think there's actually a lot of opportunity for it in our industry because most of us are small businesses that just do not remotely have the resources, possibly even to hire a marketing person, never mind to hire a whole slew of them all the way across the marketing spectrum to do all the pieces integrated and then give them money to actually spend on marketing things. Yep. And so, you know, we, we suffer from those, you know, the, the cash constraints, the capital constraints, the resource constraints for which classically outsource agencies are, are, are kind of the pathway forward and the solution. Now, you know, the challenge always is then you also actually got to find the one that delivers and, yeah. you know, the marketing world is littered with agencies that are, are big on hype and weak on delivery. And I'm sure we'll get a couple of those in our advisor world <laughs> as well. But to me, like it is the most natural model and path to get there because marketing done well takes doesn't just take dollars in the marketing. It takes people to run the marketing. And in a world where we don't just sell like $29 widgets, we sell like uh, holistic financial planning for thousands of dollars a year with clients that stick around for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, like the, the metrics for doing marketing and spending on marketing in our industry are crazy good, right? Yep. That was Ken Fisher's secret and path to hundred billion. Uh, but most of us are cash flow and capital constrained. So just find the most efficient ways to deploy that, mm-hmm. which might be you know, buying a piece of an agency as opposed to being all in on your own marketing staff. Realistically, I think is where a lot of advisors end up. Like either you make the investment commitment to hire the staff because you want to really build and grow and scale. You get really targeted around a niche because the great thing around the niche is you can find creative, innovative, lower cost marketing strategies because you can go really deep into what matters in the niche yep. and not have to compete with everybody else, you know, buying the same Google keywords for, you know, Roth IRA conversion in generic terms. For sure. Uh, or, or, you, or you work with uh, an outsourced agency that can do that full stack thing for you and, you know, ideally try to find one that delivers the results. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's so tough, especially depending on kind of where you're at in your, in the life cycle of your business. I mean, like younger advisors, I would say, if you're not well capitalized and you talk about this a lot, I agree with you. I think you have to focus your message. Otherwise you're going to get priced out of every single platform. You put an ad up on Google, $50 a click. You put an ad up on Facebook, you're trying to talk to too many pain points and your message is just going to fall. Yeah, on I mean, good, ears. good, good luck. If you're trying to compete against you know, like literally national firms that, you know, if they can spend $5 million on a Super Bowl commercial, they're going to outbid you on all the generic keyword Google ads. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and you know, writing generic content, like you are now going head to head, you know, uh, seven reasons why Roth conversions are great. Like, congratulations, your car, your article is now competing head to head with CNBC and MarketWatch and Kiplinger and all the other personal finance publications that, you know, give this stuff away for free because they're trying to get advertising dollars on, uh, attached to the eyeballs that viewed the articles. You know, the, the, for a lot of marketing, uh, you know, I mean, it's always been true in the marketing world. The more targeted you can get, the more efficient you can get with your dollars, the lower the client acquisition costs come out to be. Now, the, the flip side is if you get too targeted, like you have a really awesome client acquisition cost until you get 100% of the clients in that target. And like, then you have to yeah, go make a new thing because you done. literally <laughs> saturated the market that you were going yeah. after. So you know, marketers at scale, that's always the problem. Like you find a thing that's targeted, you 
bring down the client acquisition costs. You do as much as you can, but then eventually you exhaust that market and you got to go find the next one. The opportunity for me in an advisor world though, like we're kind of unique. Most of us can have wildly successful practices with 50 great clients. Oh yeah. Like, that's really all it takes, like 50 A-level clients. So we can get hyper-targeted and stay hyper-targeted because we, we don't have to worry about like, well, what happens if the if the results start petering off after the first five or 10,000 clients? Like, are you kidding? I need 50. You yeah. can go after underwater basket weavers and and, and own that <laughs> niche. Uh, uh, like, because you only need a couple dozen to be wildly successful. Hey, Model FAs. This podcast is all about helping you grow your business. So I wanted to share a new tool that we created to help you do just that. It's a webinar, and it's gonna show you how to add two to three plus new clients to your practice with consistency, and in some cases, without even spending any money. You can check it out at get.brewerconsulting.co forward slash webinar. Again, it's get dot brewer consulting dot co forward slash webinar we'll look forward to seeing you there yeah and just from a marketer's perspective someone who spends a lot of money in advertising and and a lot of the stuff that we're talking about you also want to be careful about get rich quick schemes because marketers what i've noticed they will get you on a call they'll get you to admit all these things and they'll say well you just need one million dollar account right to break even and it's the, the, the funny thing is, is there's so much that gets wrapped up into getting that million dollar account with paid advertising, because if you don't have your focus set up at the foundational level where you don't know what your, who, do you, who your ideal prospect is, what niche they fall into, what message is going to resonate with them, that your brand actually supports that, that message and that strategy, and that you have the appropriate platforms behind, that you're targeting in order to get that person's attention it doesn't matter how many millions of account, uh, millions of dollars you could get, it's never going to materialize. So I think the the big thing for a lot of, um, and you guys have done a great job of this at the XY Planning Network, the big thing is just helping people understand where they should start in the first place before they even begin to think about spending money or, or right. time really going after clients. Because if you don't have that figured out, you're just wasting your money and your time because your yep. message is going to fall in deaf ears. So what are your, so maybe switching gears here a little bit, um, what are your thoughts on the, the growth co- trajectory for, let's say, these smaller tech-enabled, more modern firms? Because I know there's a lot of them within XY Planning Network, they price monthly or flat fee or what, what have you. Um, how do you view the competitiveness of the landscape and how well they've positioned themselves relative to some of these larger RAs who may adopt digital marketing and those types of things to create leverage in the future. I mean, what, what type of outlook do you have for the industry in that regard? So, uh, so I, I, again, like the, the challenge to me for most firms is marketing is competitive. Like most firms don't spend anything on marketing, but as you do start spending money on marketing, what you will discover is that there are actually other firms out there that spend money on marketing uh, it's it's a smaller number that spend larger dollar amounts as opposed to a huge number of firms that eat spend a little. But the spending is out there. It is it is a competitive space, and you know th- there's always someone mm-hmm. uh, who can spend more than you on whatever you're targeting if you're targeting the same thing they're targeting. And yep. so what I you know, what we already see certainly within X Y planning network and 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 just across the industry more oh, broadly yeah. like. For people who have heard, you know, our financial advisor success podcast, you you, you know, kind of the running joke is <laughs> we're always talking about niches and specializations, but but this is why, I mean, this very directly is is why because when you start targeting into some kind of niche or specialization, you're just going after those people, and usually no one else is. Like they may be going after them generically, but like. If you're if you specialize in doctors and they're working and they're going for everyone, yeah, they might put their ads in front of the same doctors that you're going to try to be in front of. But if I'm a doctor and firm A says, "Come to us, we do good financial planning," and mm-hmm. firm B says, "Come to us, we do good financial planning for doctors," and I'm a doctor, my brain naturally goes to the second one because yep. it's, it's for me. Like I, I want things for me, right? We all we all want stuff that's that's targeted and meant special for us, for sure. And so. Uh, like the way you compete against these firms is about getting targeted. Because if I'm a huge national firm, like I can't just go after 
you know, doctors or young professional doctors or mature doctors selling their practices or like, I mean, even doctors could have like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 different sub niches within it. Any one of which can be a fantastic business for an advisor for their 50 great clients. Yep. But if I'm a national firm at scale, like I'm trying to figure out where my next 10,000 clients are going to come from. Mm-hmm. So I will completely skip over and completely ignore, uh, you know, five, uh, like 200 advisor niches yep. that are 50 clients each because I can't hit all 10,000 at once. It's not cost effective for me to do when I'm large and at scale. Yep. And so if you want to be the small advisor, like if you go after your 50 great clients, you can often do it really exp- inexpensively. If you try to get 50 of the next 10,000 clients, you're competing against the large firm that wants 10,000 of the next 10,000 clients and they are going to outbid you, outspend you, outmarket you, outresource you on everything because they can and they have the depth and resources and yeah. you've now put yourself directly in their in their competitive sites. The the other thing though I think the advantage that the advisor has that let's say specializes in physicians and one of the yes. subspecialties that they, they need to realize that their differentiator is them as a person and not their firm because I've seen a lot of and this is a big mistake I've seen a lot of uh, advisors make that have st- stood up their own firms and tried to specialize is they're trying to specialize in market as their firm and be a brand, a company first, but really they need to pull away the company and just be themselves and communicate their own value proposition. Cause that is really the only thing that's going to differentiate them because they are the one, they are the person that is going to be positioned and put in front of the physician or one of those subspecialties as the product. And they need to be evaluated as the product. And I just see too many firms that are like, here's my, here's my uh, company. It's first state doctor wealth management. It's like, no one cares about that. You know, like you need to be available. You need to have your perspective on display and that can make a lot of people uncomfortable. So would you say that you agree with that? Disagree with that? Have you coached people through that that are, you know, have, have, you know, what are your thoughts? I, 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 I agree with sort of the asterisk, like it's, it's a, it's a strategy and way to do it. Um, you know, if if I want to build a big firm that's bigger than myself and goes beyond myself, frankly, you can, you can, you can get yourself caught in a trap where if you build the marketing too centralized around the founder and the personality of the founder and kind of build a person, a a personality brand based business, you may have trouble later trying to pivot and extend that business beyond yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you even see that at, 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 at firms of size and scale, like, you know, at, Edelman Financial, chill, trying to figure out like how do we move beyond Rick Edelman's brand? You know, it's done pretty well. It got them twenty billion dollars under management, <laughs> but now as they try to figure out like how do we go from twenty to fifty or twenty to a hundred, uh, you know, they're they're anchored heavily around a particular persona of a guy who at some point is going to retire. Yep, and and that becomes a challenge for the firm. So you know, lo and behold, they got packaged together with financial engines because that'll give them millions of four hundred one k plan participants. So they got a place to get clients without without relying as much on a written necessarily. So I, you can you can have some challenges of that. You can also get pretty stinking big, anyways, right? Edelman got to twenty billion. Ken Fisher got to a hundred billion. They're still largely, you know, individual persona based businesses. Uh, but for a lot of advisors, like it gets really hard for them to scale their marketing anywhere beyond themselves in their own personal capacity if they do that kind of personal brand approach marketing. Now, the, the flip side is for a whole lot of advisors, like, who cares? Yeah. You get your 50 great clients. They pay you a couple thousand dollars each. You make 60 to 80% net take-home pay as a solo efficient advisor. You could make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and then you've got all your clients and you just have to service them well and have a lot of spare time and amazing work-life balance while you make hundreds of thousands of dollars. So for plenty of you, like, awesome. Like, you can fully check all the boxes you need to check. Yep. Uh, making a wonderfully successful business built entirely around your personal brand. Uh, the, the space that I do think firms get in trouble with that you're highlighting and I, and I fully agree with is, is they, Middle ground. they try to split the difference. Like, look, I don't want it to be too focused on me because I might want to grow beyond me. So I try to make it about the firm, but they don't take this additional steps ready to really make the firm a distinct brand. They just sort of make it a generic, you know, insert name, insert generic name here, or financial planning and wealth management, because, you know, they don't want to make it about themselves. And and then it's, it's just not a brand that connects with anyone. And it's not interesting from a marketing perspective. 
Yep. You're just another generic named firm that no one's heard of and no one knows why they should work with. And it's not very compelling. So yeah, I think the, the thing that does come through when people tend to make personal brand businesses is they tend to be, they tend to be willing to make, you know, like stronger branding statements and take stronger positions because they just tend to do it around themselves. And, and it's a little bit more natural. And I find firms sometimes have trouble distinguishing themselves when they're trying to stay, you know, generic and not founder centric. Yep. And, and that's what gets them in trouble. Like you can decide to make the, the, you know, the marketing about the firm and not about you, but you, you still have to make it interesting and unique and distinct. And that means standing up and saying some things that not everyone else is saying, uh, because uh, otherwise you're just going to get lost in the wash of frankly, very large firms that say very generic things, but do it with millions and millions of dollars of marketing. Yeah. And, and you're not going to win against them and their brands. They are, they're just going to outspend you. It's funny. I, I actually ran a test on this on Facebook. We haven't tested it on LinkedIn or any, any of the other platforms yet, but we marketed uh, same marketing spend, same ad as a uh, brand, as a company brand versus a public figure, just a face. And it was about 45% reduced uh, engagement click through and conversion costs on the public figure, the personal brand versus the company brand. Because you know, Facebook obviously is going to be a little bit more of a personal interaction type of platform. But I think what I'm seeing in the marketplace is just people want real stuff. They don't want the brand, yeah. you know, unless you can spend a lot of money to reinforce it and you have yep. a really strong persona driven brand. I think that helps yep. in the buying cycle when people become more solution driven. But if you can become, if you can be authentic and you can be yourself to a yep. degree in our business, like people are searching for that information. So but yeah, I agree yeah, you with can, you 100%. You can, take your, you can take your personal self out of the brand if you really want to, because you yep. you're concerned about being too personal brand centric, but you can't take the human out of the brand. Agreed. You know, this is a human to human business, right? Like if I just wanted a generic nameless firm where I can be a, you know, a generic number that calls in, like there's plenty of call in centers and large scale mm -hmm. national firms and banks and all that other stuff where I can be one of the numbers. Like if you, if you want to hang your hat on customized, individualized, personal financial advice that has a deep relationship with his clients, clients have relationships with human beings not with nameless firms. So you can market your firm, but you still have to figure out how to humanize the brand because humans want humans. I agree. Michael, as uh, just parting advice, is there any words of wisdom that you could give to the listeners on, you know, let's say they want to grow their firm, they want to market, but they're not sure where to start. Like what, what do you, what advice do you generally give to, to firms that are thinking about marketing, but haven't really started turning the engine on yet? So, so the, the, the two takeaways I'll give to this, the, the one uh, kind of repeating the earlier point, like if you have gotten any clients at all, sit down and figure out what your client acquisition cost was. It should be mm -hmm. a key metric of your firm that you track every year. How much, you know, how much dollars did you spend? How much money did you spend on staff? How much of your time did you spend and assign a dollar value to your time? and get an understanding of what your client acquisition cost is. You can make the resource decision about how much you're going to do with your time and how much you're going to do with cash, and you may or may not have more of one resource than another <laughs> to do that. But this is a key metric to know. And once you know it, you start thinking about how do I reduce it, right? So I can get a better ROI on my marketing spend in dollars and efforts. And that already will start to lead you down a more constructive road of thinking productively about your marketing and how to do it better and more efficiently. Like you, you need a better metric than just, yeah. I got a client or I didn't get a client. Uh, how you build is focusing on the acquisition cost of a client and then try to figure out how to do more of it at a sustained acquisition cost or ideally do more of it for less. And, and just once you measure it, your brain starts thinking about how to do better at it. Hmm. The, the second thing that I would add to this, like once you think at a client acquisition cost realm and recognizing that most of us only need 50 great clients to be wildly successful, it starts becoming really clear why niches and specialization and getting more targeted work so well. Because mm -hmm. if you start thinking about how to spend on marketing, you start actually looking at where you could spend on marketing and what you might do and who you will be competing against, right? Just, you know, look at what other ads are already there for the same thing and see how you stack up against them. Yep. What, what you will quickly notice is the more generic you are, the harder it is going to be standing out against all the other people that are spending marketing dollars on the same thing with frankly, usually bigger and better brands or just more marketing spend than you have the resources for. Yep. And the more targeted you get, 
And the more willing you are to have a niche or a specialization, you know, most advisors I find are just terrified. Like, oh my God, if I re- get really specialized, like what about the 99% of people I meet who aren't in my niche? Do I have to turn them away? I'm like, don't kid yourself. They weren't <laughs> calling you anyways. The only issue is right now you see a hundred people and get none of them. So if you stand up with a billboard that says the best financial planner for 27 year old doctors and stand on a corner and you get a hundred percent of the 27 year old doctors who walk by, heck, you might only get one, but that's one more than the zero you were going to get by standing on the street corner saying, I'm a financial planner. want to work with me. The more targeted you get, the more you start grabbing one or two or three at a time. And you know, look, if you want to figure out how to scale to 10,000 10, clients and a million clients, you're going to have to go a different direction. Yep. But if what you want to get is your 50 great clients and a great income and living, and then maybe someday you'll take the 50 to 100 and grow a little further from there. It's all about how you get targeted and focused. And what you'll find once you measure your client acquisition cost, you'll find that the more targeted you get, the lower your client acquisition cost, and the more efficiently you can get clients and bring them in. Straight truth, straight from the mouth of Michael Kitts is the man. Michael, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your time and enjoyed the discussion. Hope to have you on again soon. My pleasure. Thank you, Patrick. And thanks everyone for hanging out, listening in.